uh, we've kind of turned a corner from chapter 12 on. It's really been very, very practical. All the doctrinal stuff up before that, as Paul typically does in his epistles, we say doctrine and then duty. Uh, and uh, I, as we've gone through that, now we've kind of concluded all of that. We're at the end, last couple of messages. Uh, and in this, uh, Paul then it begins to just kind of share his heart with the church there. We get a glimpse into what motivates Paul, why he does what he does. Uh, and in the process, certainly we continue to learn from Paul and the great example that he has set for us. Uh, we've titled this the motivation of Paul's ministry, and, uh, and hopefully there'll be something in here that'll uh, motivate you as, as well. Ken Hughes says of Paul's life, that Paul's life is a cause for amazement and reflection. In the context of the times in which he lived, the situation appeared absurd. On one side, there was Rome, the metropolis of the world, heart of the empire, insufferably proud of her seven hills, shaking the earth with the march of her fabled legions. On the other side was this little Jew with a scarred face and a feeble body, ostensibly impudent amid such power, armed only with something he called the good news. Yet he changed the history of Rome, Western civilization, and indeed our own lives. It is pretty... And it is an amazing story and what Paul accomplished uh, in his life. But let's look first at the fact that he was able to do it because he saw his life as fulfilling the duty of a priest. And that's kind of buried in the language here in verses 14 to 16 where he writes, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brother, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified uh, by the Holy Spirit. And the imagery here in the language is of that of a priest uh, serving uh, in the temple. And that's the way Paul saw his life, regardless of what he was uh, what he was doing. We first see notice that the confidence he had actually was in the church there, these believers that he had never met. He writes in the second half of verse 15 to remind uh, you of them again because of the grace uh, God has given me. Obviously, they knew the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. They understood the grace of God. They were already saved. But he certainly has enumerated, uh, reminded, and pointed out to help us all understand really the meaning of what it is to be a Christian and how we're, we're saved. And he's confident, he says, because of the grace of God. Uh, there may be few people that know the grace of God uh, in a greater way than the Apostle Paul, the persecutor of the church, torturing people to try to get them to denounce their faith, breaking up families, throwing people in jail, separating mothers and fathers from their children. And it wasn't enough. He was so zealous. He wasn't only doing it in Jerusalem. As he watched the death of the first martyr, Stephen, then he gets letters and it's on his way to Damascus to see who he can arrest and bring back for imprisonment there. Uh, on the way, of course, he is arrested, in a sense, by Jesus Christ, uh, if, wh whom he says, why are you persecuting me? Jesus so related to the church and to the people that were suffering those hardships. It was as if he were going through it himself. Why do you kick against the goads, Paul? A lot of, a lot of commentators believe those goads were the fact that he had witnessed the death of Stephen and heard those words. Uh, asking uh, that his enemies, those that were murdering him, would be forgiving. And, uh, and it certainly had its impact on the Apostle Paul. He'd experienced God's grace in a powerful way. And he says, now by that grace, he's confident in them, that they're full of goodness, confident in knowledge, and able to instruct one another. And then the heart of this thing is actually in verse 16, where it kind of unfolds. And we say it's the commission Paul had to minister to the Gentiles. In verse 16, he says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ. Paul could have used a lot of words. And his typical word for minister would usually be doulos, that of a servant, a servant, a minister. He could have used another word uh, where we get our word presbyter or overseer, which he uses occasionally. But instead, he uses a, a word which in Greek, we kind of just say it into English, uh, which basically is liturgy. Uh, it's the picture of a priest actually serving in the temple. That's the term that he uses uh, here uh, for himself as a minister of Christ Jesus. Uh, and notice, to the Gentiles. And when uh, he was first apprehended there on the Damascus Road, God said, I'm going to call you to go to the Gentiles. You know, and I've thought about this a lot. And maybe you have too. He seems like the, the unlikely guy. Here you've got Paul, the or very orthodox Jew. 
uh, in terms of his uh, rabbinical training, uh, we know, he says, uh, exceeding beyond his peers, he had the opportunity to stay, study at the feet of Gamaliel, according to Judaism today, and in that day, one of the great rabbis of, uh, of all time. Uh, and that's the guy we're going to send out to, uh, to the Gentiles. How about Peter? I mean, big fisherman, kind of the gruff, tough guy. Uh, why not send him to the Gentiles? I mean, he's had no formal training and everything. He's been with Jesus. Certainly, he knows the scriptures. Man, listen to the guy teach and preach, and uh, he knew the word of God. But wouldn't that be a, a better fit than, uh, than Rabbi Saul going out to the Gentiles? Uh, it's interesting. But uh, uh, when you think about it, as we've learned, even in going through this letter, uh, the church, uh, very early on, of course, is 100% Jewish. Uh, Paul goes out and begins preaching the gospel, and Gentiles are getting saved. That's a cause for concern for the leaders of the church, which are still located in Jerusalem. And in fact, in Acts 15, they have to have a whole discussion to figure out what to do with the Gentiles. Because the, the, the thought, the prevailing thought, would have been, well, they need to proselytize and become Jews so they can get saved through the Jewish Messiah, after hearing about the Jewish prophets concerning him uh, and reading the Jewish scriptures uh, about him as well. It only makes sense. We kind of compared it to uh, you're standing in line at an uh, uh, airport or immigration or somewhere, uh, and it's only 98 degrees. Uh, I'm actually repeating the scene of myself. And, uh, you know, you're this huge line, uh, over an hour, you finally get up close to where yeah, you need to get, and then people start cutting in in front of you. You're just not really thrilled and are full of a lot of joy uh, at that point. Uh, and that's the way the Jews felt like in terms of the Gentiles are just like, wait, wait, get at the end of the line. You can't just be, I understand grace, but you can't just cut in up there. It was a big deal. It was a big issue. Well, who led all of them to the Lord? One of the great rabbinical scholars of the day, a guy named Paul. So if you've got to have, if you're a Gentile, and you've got to have your guy go to this council in Jerusalem, you might be glad that it's Paul as opposed to Peter or somebody else. If somebody's got to get up there and reason from the scriptures and the traditions of the rabbi, why God always planned to save these Gentiles, why not Paul? Uh, very interesting uh, to even, even consider. Uh, God had certainly a special calling on his life, and whatever he did, he saw it all like a priest uh, serving uh, in, in the temple. Uh, it also speaks to the fact that God has a sense of humor or the idea that you know, we do feel like, you know, it's easier to share with people that we can relate to, to talk like us, look like us, uh, and, and so forth. And, and there's certainly a, a lot of truth to that. We sometimes say you should, you know, bloom where you're planted kind of, kind of a thing. Uh, but it also should say to us, we should never underestimate God, how he might want to use us in the life of somebody that is like completely different. I think we're all could be very thankful that uh, there was a, guy, a bald-headed guy named Chuck Smith that was willing to reach out to a bunch of long-haired hippies, which uh, if you're not sure where that is, just watch Duck Dynasty, those older ones there. <laughs> but uh, you learn about two opposites. There's a guy grown up in the church, been a Christian his whole life and so forth, and he's reaching out to these uh, uh, to these kids. That's complete opposites. There's our, our uh, I get a kick out of our uh, good friend, Henry Monterita, who's uh, uh, raised in South America, ends up at Bible uh, Moody Bible Institute, uh, gets called by God as, a, as an evangelist and so forth. And he likes to, and I, I can't even imitate him, he likes to talk very fast with a heavy Spanish accent and you have to really track along to hear him. And who does God call him to? To reach Jewish people in Jerusalem. There you go. I saw that coming way off. No, not really. Uh, you know, it's just amazing. Don't underestimate how God might use you in somebody else's life. Yeah, it's great. Sometimes we're comfortable with people that were you know, we can relate to, but it doesn't mean that he can't use you to reach some 14-year-old kid on a skateboard out here at the shopping center or uh, whoever it might be. Uh, certainly the Apostle Paul was not the likely choice, but he was certainly God's choice for the Gentiles. Thirdly, the Gentile converts, well, he saw them as an offering being presented to God. Verse 16, the last half, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. The word acceptable, again, is a reference to a sacrifice being given in the temple. It wasn't grain. It wasn't uh, turtle doves. It wasn't a lamb. It was people. Uh, every time Paul went out, he's, whatever he was doing, whatever dusty road he was walking down, whatever ship that he was on, whatever he was going, whatever prison he happened to be in in whatever city, he saw it all as a priestly duty. 
Uh, he was serving God as if somebody were actually in the temple. Everything became sacred to him uh, every step along the way. And when someone came to faith in Christ among these Gentiles, he goes, man, that's like a sweet incense rising up to God. Kind of, you kind of get a picture just in these couple of verses of his motivation, why he did what he did. It certainly should be our motivation as well, because after all, we're all referred to as priests of God as well. Uh, you know, we only have one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, Paul tells Timothy. But uh, Peter tells us that we're, we're all priests. We all come directly to God. We represent God to, uh, to other, other people. Uh, and in the same way, we can have the same heart as the Apostle Paul. So it doesn't matter what we do, even if it's baking a pie to take to a neighbor, uh, that's priestly duty. It can be seen as something sacred. Uh, the person teaching Sunday school or holding a baby for somebody else, it's all sacred duty if it's done for the, for the glory of God. We actually call this the Protestant refer, uh, work ethic. <coughs> Coming from the Protestant uh, Reformation, it affected first uh, the guilds that were there. Uh, people were doing crafts, and it was just a way to earn a living, whatever they did, whatever they built, whatever they designed, whatever they were involved in. Uh, but they really got this teaching and got this concept, and then believed that if I do what I do to the very best of my ability, and I do it for the glory of God, it's a sacred offering. Uh, it was not just, well, it was not just those in the ministry, those preaching the gospel, teaching the word, that they had something sacred to do. No, we all have something sacred to do. It rose the level uh, of the excellence and the ability of what people did in, in that whole arena. Uh, and of course, it got carried with our forefathers to our own country and helped shape who we are as, uh, as Americans today. Uh, but Paul had this kind of heart. Everything that he did was like a priest in the temple. Uh, and when he led someone to the Lord, it was like a, a sacrifice or a sweet incense being brought before the Lord. Uh, so he had a sense of fulfilling the duty of a priest. Secondly, his great desire was to glorify God. That's in verse 17 and 19. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, and to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem around about to uh, Illyricum, I have prepared to preach the gospel of Christ. That's the former uh, Yugoslavia, where he's making reference there. So 1,400 miles, Paul's uh, carried the gospel. Uh, Paul's desire was for God to be glorified in all that he did. We see that in verse 17. The word translated glory here is the idea of boast or to take pride in, but it was not in himself or any of his accomplishments. It was always in what the Lord had done. Paul was never bragging about his ministry. He was always boasting in the Lord and what the Lord has done. Look at verse 18. For I dare not speak, I, I, I will not dare to speak uh, of any of the, those things which Christ has not accomplished through me. And, uh, and of course, we could all, uh, uh, all this uh, preacher and ministry types could uh, learn from that. Uh, sometimes we'll, we'll hear from people all the great things that they've done from the Lord. Paul's saying, I've never done any great thing from the Lord. Uh, it's, all, it's all about what God has done uh, in and through me. It's kind of a classic funny story about D.L. Moody, uh, uh, the great evangelist, and uh, going through uh, a major city uh, in the United States. And he's with Ira Shanky, who was kind of his, uh, his uh, singer uh, of the day and so forth. Uh, he was British and dry humor, and uh, they had a lot of... Moody was kind of a big, uh, you know, uh, ate too much, talked too much, uh, big guy. And so they were always kind of going at it with each other a bit. And they were wa walking down the street. And uh, uh, Shanky saw a, a, a drunk uh, staggering out of, the, out of the gutter and walking, walking to them. So he says, he says to Moody, he says, hey, look, here's, here's comes one of your converts from, from the other night. And, uh, and uh, Moody looks back at him and, uh, and says, uh, uh, he goes, well, uh, if he's one of my converts, then, uh, then uh, I would agree with you. But uh, I don't have any converts. They're all, a, all those converts are the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's saying, I can't save anybody. Uh, and uh, uh, if the people that uh, were saved by me, it's no wonder they would look like that. It's all the Lord and what the Lord has done. Paul says the Gentiles have come to believe. There's been signs and miracles that have been accompanied by uh, ministry. 
And again, Paul uh, did those things through the power of God, those wonders, uh, always to authenticate the, the message, uh, not the messenger. Uh, and they were done to arrest people's attention uh, so they would be open to the gospel. I, I know as a young Christian, I always thought, I had friends I was sharing with, and I thought, you know, if they could just see a miracle, they just see God do something miraculous, I know they would believe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen enough miracles to not impact people now, uh, and it amazes me. It, it can get people's attention, certainly, uh, but they don't uh, don't save any anybody. I remember praying uh, with a couple of guys for uh, a guy that had cancer at one point in time. I uh, had a tumor, been to the doctor, ready to do the surgery, planned the chemo and the radiation. It was all ready to go. Wasn't a believer, but had a family member that came to church, brought him in. Uh, we, we prayed for him, and uh, then we heard from him uh, a couple weeks later. Uh, very excited because no tumor in everything. Wasn't praising the Lord. He said the doctors told him he was misdiagnosed. Really wasn't, a, they must have seen something else. And, you know, interesting, you know, there's tumor there, it's cancer, if we're going to operate on you, oh, we just misdiagnosed. Uh, it's like, no, the Lord healed you. But, you know, it's just, it's just interesting. You would think if that were you, <laughs> you would drop on your knees in the doctor's office when he said there was no tumor and give your life to Jesus Christ right then. It doesn't really work that way. But God uses these things because he's got a heart for people. Uh, he's compassionate towards people uh, to heal them on occasion. Uh, and it certainly authenticates the message as it did uh, the Apostle Paul. And third, then, he makes reference to the region that he preached in, as I mentioned, uh, 1,400 miles from Jerusalem all the way to uh, what uh, was the former uh, Yugoslavia. Not, not bad for a guy in sandals. You know, just think if he had a good pair of boots or Nike, you know, he could have made it, made it a lot further. But uh, uh, traveling wasn't easy. That was, uh, that was saying a lot. But again, Paul's taking no credit for it. You know, he said, this is simply what Christ did through me, always pointing us back to, to Jesus Christ. Reminds me of uh, I've seen I've seen played out uh, you know coaching uh, little guys in uh, in baseball for a number of years at that seven and eight year old coach pitch age and the first time up and they uh, you know it's kind of like uh, sometimes call it three stooges baseball you know initially they get pretty good over the season but uh, you know the guy you know little guy gets up and barely hits the ball it dribbles barely dribbles down to third base. Uh, he's not sure where to really run, but he, you know, he's listening to coach. He makes his way to first base. Kid uh, grabs it over there. He throws it completely over the first baseman's head. So now he's told to run to second. Uh, they chase the ball down. They throw it out the left field somewhere, and the guy comes all the way around. Doesn't need to slide, but he wants to slide. So he slides <laughs> into a home plate and jumps up and says, wow, that was my first home run. <laughs> Well, he got on a nerve. That's not really a home run. You hate to break the news to him and everything. Uh, sometimes that's the way we are with the Lord. Uh, we set out to do something, to share, or do something for the Lord, whatever it might it might be, some little kindness to someone, and something great comes out of it. And we, we get done and go, man, that was my first home run. No, that was actually the Lord. Just kind of orchestrating everything, doing it all. That's the idea here of the Apostle Paul. Uh, it would be hard to imagine the Apostle Paul and all the experiences he's had and the stories that he could tell sitting around with the guys. Did you hear about uh, when I was in Iconium? It was difficult, you know. They were, they were a lot of persecution there, but I just stood up. I stood tall for Jesus. They took me out of that city. They threw the stones on me. They left me in a trash heap. Didn't bother me. I just got up and went right back in because I am the Apostle Paul. It, probably not. Uh, and yet sometimes, exaggeration of course, but uh, uh, we, we miss the point in terms that it's God that's really working uh, in and through our lives. And Paul was always very quick to give God uh, the glory. He says to the church in Galatia, uh, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God was everything to Paul. And secondly, in terms of his desire, it was for us to know where the power came from. That's in verse 19. By the power of the Spirit of God. Paul knew that his life had been radically transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it gave him reason to believe then that God could transform the lives of those around him as well. 
Uh, and I think when we're young believers and that process is going and God's uh, doing some amazing uh, changes in our lives, I think sometimes it's easier for us to share that message and believe that message on behalf of other people. And I think sometimes as we have walked with the Lord for a number of years, and in my case a number of decades, uh, you can almost forget what you were before and how much God has changed you. And uh, and when you do, I think we're, we're in... Uh, in danger of uh, no longer realizing that uh, it's the power of the words of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can uh, radically change someone. That's why Paul begins this epistle by saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Uh, and that uh, includes the, the transforming power of the work of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 19 at the end he says, I fully proclaim uh, the gospel of Christ. I don't think it means he used all the right words or all the words. I just think it means he never lost focus. Uh, he knew what his mission in life was. He knew what his purpose was. And uh, he was out there carrying it out to the best of his ability. Uh, again, fulfilling the duty of a priest is desire to glorify God. Uh, and he does that uh, here in verse 20 to 29, I think. We get an insight to the fact that God had given him a, a real dream for his life. We might call it a vision or a calling or commission. Uh, but I think God's got that for each and every one of us. Uh, and, if, and if we're not sure what it is, we should seek him and, uh, and find out what it is so that we could be about uh, our Father's business. But look at verse 20. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer have any place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contribution to the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles had been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Here's Paul's dream. Give him a desire to preach the gospel where, where no man had gone before. Kind of like the Starship Enterprise. Or going where no man had gone before. That's, that's the, uh, the Apostle Paul. You wonder where they got that. It's right here in the Bible. Uh, uh, he voices the, uh, this explicitly in 2 Corinthians 10, 16. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's fear or, or accomplishment. It's a very unique calling. Not everybody's got it. We'd say it's a missionary calling. Uh, to go not where, uh, as a church planner, Paul could have been a church planner, gone throughout southern uh, Judea, maybe been very successful at it, but that was not the dream uh, or the commission that God had uh, given him. Uh, it was very unique. And, uh, we would say, secondly, uh, taking the gospel uh, in terms of this dream, well, it was extreme. We see that in verse 24. Whenever I journey to, to uh, Spain, uh, now, uh, I don't think Paul wanted to go to Spain because he loved Mexican food. I'm just guessing. I'm just throwing that in. But uh, Spain was like off the map. You know, when Jonah wants to run away from, uh, from God, uh, he gets on a ship and heads to Spain. He heads to Tarshish. as far away as you can get. Uh, Spain, Great Britain, uh, when you're living in the Mediterranean in the first century, that was the end of the world. And uh, Paul says, I'm taking it to the end of the world. I'm going to try to get to the end of the world, and I'm going to stop on the way uh, to, uh, to see you guys. Uh, that certainly is the heart of the Apostle Paul. A lot of other missionaries certainly have been like that. David Livingston uh, was, uh, was similar. When he joined the London Missionary Society, they asked him where he wanted to go. And he said, anywhere, as long as it's forward. And, uh, and certainly he did, as he had such a tremendous impact uh, on the continent of Africa. But uh, Paul dreamed impossible dreams, uh, and certainly that's fundamental to greatness of, uh, of any kind, of any profession, but certainly when our dreams come from God. And then thirdly, Paul's dream included bringing Jews and Gentiles together. We see that in this offering he mentions in verse 26. 
where he says, For it pleased those of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution uh, to the poor. So this is an offering, uh, and it's necessary. There's a couple of things uh, uh, going on. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you're Jewish in the first century, of course it happens uh, uh, throughout time and today, and you come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah, uh, not always, but very often you are then ostracized from your family. And in that day, that meant the family business. You did what your father did, what his father did, what his father did. So you not only were ostracized from the family, you probably lost your part in the family business and lost your job. We also know that during this period in the first century, there was a tremendous drought in that part of the world. So uh, things were pretty bad anyway, economically, uh, in the, uh, the believers, the Jewish believers uh, in Jerusalem uh, were in, uh, in pretty tough shape here financially. Uh, Paul's been going around as he established the churches and goes back to visit them. Uh, and he's been taking up an offering to take back to them. Of course, he's hoping it's a practical thing, but he's hoping it'll, it'll bring these two very, very diverse groups of people uh, together. Uh, as uh, we just saw last week, uh, the need for unity. And, and, uh, and we'll see that it does that. Now, he details this offering and talking about it. Uh, writing to the church in Corinth, uh, his second letter, chapter 8 and 9. Uh, at the beginning there, verse 1, of, uh, verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 8, he says, To them, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, even beyond their ability, they were freely willing. So he's talking about the offering. He's kind of he's kind of laying into the Corinthians a little bit because he's saying, uh, I've been up the area there, uh, Macedonia, where they were they were they were very poor, very poor, simple farmers. They don't they don't have a lot, uh, but he's saying these guys gave beyond their ability, uh, and and he's kind of bragging on them. And he's coming to Corinth, uh, and basically uh, Corinth it was a big booming city at the time. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the believers apparently were successful business types and everything. Uh, and he's kind of laying it on them uh, about uh, this offering that he wants to take back to, uh, to Jerusalem. And he goes there, he does collect it and so forth. And we know from the book of Acts that he does uh, make it uh, back to Jerusalem with the offering. Uh, he takes it uh, to them uh, and it does what he was hoping it would do. Not only practically provide for them, but it brings these two very diverse groups of people together. Uh, which certainly was critical in the history of the church uh, at that point in time. And sometimes uh, extreme conditions can do that. Difficult times can do that when we're willing to reach out to someone else, especially somebody else very different from us uh, who is hurting and so forth. Uh, it can certainly bring a tremendous, uh, tremendous unity. About a year ago, I was uh, teaching there in Japan with uh, the, uh, the Calvary guys, the pastors, and, and uh, we had a little session with... Uh, uh, the senior pastor uh, on the side, I was talking to them, uh, and we were kind of recapping all of the ministry that had taken place up in the Tohoku area uh, in the last uh, year and a half. And so uh, after, the, uh, of course, the, uh, the tidal wave uh, and then the uh, destruction of the uh, Fukushima nuclear plant, which we still have problems with, uh, and uh, we, at that time initially, we, we knew here, at least we, some of us knew, there was uh, radiation in the air for about uh, 50 miles out. Uh, the government there was telling them it was 35. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, w what had happened is one of the guys that uh, headed up a huge relief ministry uh, during that time uh, said that, uh, uh, of course, you can imagine, there were some folks who were a little reluctant to just charge right up there uh, and, and help. Uh, there were a lot of safeguards in place for uh, our own uh, military that was uh, going in, and they were monitoring uh, very closely. Uh, keeping the uh, you know the carriers and stuff uh, far offshore uh, in case the, the wind changed that was it was a big concern uh, but what happened uh, he was telling us uh, Jonathan was telling us is that uh, and again his ministry is beyond Calvary Chapel it's it's out to the, the whole body of Christ doing that relief ministry so he's working with a lot of uh, uh, denominational types that traditionally uh, the Western missionaries are not quite as accepted as they should be among the Japanese nationals in terms of the pastors. Uh, but when this occurred, the first guys up there, the first guys on the scene, were all the Western guys. And 
then they, they could, the, the national guys kind of, you know, well, I, I guess we better jump in and get going here and uh, start loading up our trucks and, uh, and heading up there. Uh, but what they saw was the heart that these guys had. Uh, and uh, he says one of the, the lasting things uh, that came out of all the, uh, the outreach was uh, tremendous unity. Uh, among uh, among all the, all the folks working there for the kingdom of God, regardless of their country uh, of origin, and God uh, and He went on to talk about some of the other things that came out of, of course, church plants and so forth. But that was one of the things there. Uh, there's a unity there that came about because somebody was willing to do something kind of extreme uh, to help somebody else, uh, and that's what's going on here with uh, with the Apostle Paul uh, in terms of uh, bringing about this offering. Uh, and he's making reference to the church here. Hey, I'd love to come to you guys, uh, but I've got I've got to go to Jerusalem first. He also says it's a way of paying a debt. Look at verse 27. He said they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. So the Gentiles were pleased to do it in these churches, and Paul says in a sense they owe it. Why? Because as he uh, says there, uh, there was a spiritual debt that they owed. Again, keep in mind. We Gentiles, when we come to faith in Christ, it's in a Jewish Messiah based on the Jewish prophecies, based on the Jewish writers of the scriptures. And we're the wild olive, uh, olive tree that's been grafted into the natural olive tree, as he described uh, for us there in Romans 9, 10, uh, and 11. And he says, because there is a spiritual debt, there's an opportunity now to do something on a material level to help pay that debt uh, back uh, once again. That continues to be an issue in the church today. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got Israel as a nation uh, in unbelief uh, back in, in the land. Uh, but at the same time, 85% of the church today around the world are those that call themselves Christians, believe in replacement theology, and believe that all the promises made to them have now been adopted and come to the church. Uh, and therefore, since uh, Israel as a nation has rejected their Messiah uh, and we have received them, uh, basically we don't have to give them the time of day and so forth led to a lot of uh, terrible things uh, through the centuries, a lot of anti-Semitism and so forth. Uh, and if we understand the book of Romans and its, uh, its very Jewish nature uh, and understand the early church, it'll prevent us from, uh, from seeing things uh, incorrectly. Uh, this was a, a way of paying the debt. They were pleased to do it, and indeed, they owed it to them. Uh, Paul's dream, secondly, was, uh, was what kept him or hindered him from going forward. That's in verse 24. I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey. Verse 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister uh, to the saints. So uh, you, hopefully you remember the story in the book of Acts. It's uh, about uh, Act 21 or so forth. Paul gets back, takes the offering, and it was accepted. Uh, and, uh, and they were excited, uh, and it did everything he hoped it, it, it would do in terms of the unity of the church and so forth. Uh, and then after that, they said, you know what, uh, Paul, probably what you should do, uh, since you, you've been out there in all these regions uh, around the world with all these Gentiles coming back in, you know, a lot of people might be a little questioning uh, your own uh, beliefs and uh, in practices in terms of Judaism and so forth. Why don't you go on down to the temple and go through a cleansing and so forth, and you can go in the temple and, uh, and uh, be a witness there and, uh, and worship the Lord and so forth. You remember Paul did that. He even uh, paid uh, for a, a couple of other guys to go with him. He's there down on the Temple Mount. It's a feast day. The thing is packed with people. Some people recognize him, who he is, in terms of out preaching the gospel uh, in the, uh, to the Gentiles and ministering the word of God in the synagogues wherever he goes well, proving that Jesus is the Messiah. They're not real thrilled with him. Refer to them as the Judaizers. And so they start saying, that guy has brought Gentiles into the court of the men, which is uh, punishable by death. And a uh, little with the crowd up and so forth, and they're about ready to tear the Apostle Paul uh, apart. Uh, there in the Temple Mount, uh, uh, just above it is the Antonio Fortress, built in, uh, in above so that the Romans could look down in case something like that happened. They could kind of monitor what was taking place uh, there. Uh, and of course, they see this guy being ripped apart down there, and the, uh, the guy that's the CEO there sends, uh, <laughs> sends some guys down, and they rescue the Apostle Paul, basically. And you remember the rest of the story. Then he's brought in, and he's in chains, and, uh, and uh, then he just happens to mention, oh, by the way, did I mention I'm a Roman citizen? Oh, hey, we're very sorry about those chains here. What, uh, can I get you a glass of water or something? And, uh, 
uh, and then you know he kind of you know gets word that there, there's guys that have made a vow to uh, uh, to the death that they're going to kill him and so forth uh, in uh, in Jerusalem, uh, and so basically they uh, they get some uh, some guys uh, special op guys and they get them out in the middle of the night, take them over to uh, Caesarea Maritima, and uh, uh, and he's over there and he stands a couple a couple of trials where he uses those to uh, uh, to preach the gospel, and in the end. Then he makes his appeal to uh, to Caesar. One of the really cool things about going to, to Jerusalem is you can stand uh, in the on the pavement where the Apostle Paul stood to give his defense uh, before Felix uh, in Agrippa, uh, and you can see the area where he left to set sail for Rome. So he's going to get there. He's going to get there, Rome. It's just not going to be the way he envisioned. He's, he believes it's going to be as he goes on his way to Spain. Uh, he just didn't know the Roman government would be paying all expenses uh, for him uh, as he as he headed out. And you remember, even in the, the ship, the, when the ship's going down there in the Mediterranean, uh, there's a, there's a night where uh, an angel of the Lord, Paul says, an angel of the Lord uh, appeared to me and said, "Don't be afraid, Paul." They always say that because you're afraid. It's not like in case; it's because you think you're about ready to die. Don't be afraid, Paul. Uh, you know, uh, for God is going to allow you to testify. Uh, before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you as well. Uh, he followed the story. Of course, he makes it, and uh, as he hits the shore, then some of these folks that have read this letter have come down to uh, meet him and kind of escort him up uh, and into this to the city. Uh, but uh, a dream was hindered from going forward. Uh, that scene there in Acts 21, uh, just to go back to that for a moment, it says that all the city was disturbed. And the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, uh, news came uh, to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in, a, was in an uproar. Uh, and the application for this, I think, is, all, is very important. Uh, church, history says, church history says that uh, Paul is, uh, is, you know, stands before Nero and preaches the gospel. In uh, a short time after that, it seems like however, however wicked Nero was, uh, you know, he just... Uh, he loses it uh, after that. You know, burns the city down, blames it on the Christian. Uh, Nero is a very, very wicked guy. Uh, some of some of these believers that he's writing to, he's saying it's important to have unity. Some of them are thrown to the lions. You have the whole Colosseum thing going on. Uh, he's he's taking Christians and uh, uh, and uh, painting them with tar uh, and then putting them on poles and lighting them uh, so he can ride his chariot uh, in his garden at night. This is Nero. So this is who Paul preaches the uh, the gospel to. And, uh, and he is uh, released after that, according to church history, and he makes it up into Spain uh, in Great Britain on his way back down to Rome. He's arrested a second time. Then he's uh, beheaded outside the city for his faith in Jesus Christ. Not crucified because he is uh, a Roman citizen. Uh, that's that's uh, church tradition. Uh, uh, you know, modern day scholarship says we don't really have any evidence that he ever made it to, to, to Spain. Uh, and, uh, and my point is, uh, to God, I don't think it mattered. I don't think it mattered. Uh, he had a dream what God gave him. He had a vision and a calling on his life, and he was just going for it. Uh, I don't think God really cares if we, if we make it to the destination. I think he's more concerned about the journey on the way there. How did Paul react when he was in prison? How did Paul respond to the believers when he did come upon them? Uh, what did he say when he was on Mars Hill and he had to do with the intellectuals of that day? Would he soften the gospel or not? Would he make a good defense? He's more concerned with the journey and how we get there. And I think that the, uh, the same is true of our, of our own lives. One writer said, may we learn to travel as Paul did. Someday we may stand before God and will possibly say, God, this is the dream you gave me. I did not make it. I'm sorry. And he will say, yes. Uh, but that was in my hands. You were a magnificent traveler. Enter the joy which I prepared before you, before the foundation of the world. I love that line. You're a wonderful traveler. You know, I don't know if you've uh, done a lot of traveling around, but some people are not wonderful travelers. <laughs> They're wonderful complainers. Uh, it's not easy sometimes. Uh, but uh, I think we'd agree that Paul was a magnificent uh, traveler. Whatever the dream is, whatever God's given you to do in your life. Uh, you know, I don't think Paul ever felt like, well, I never made it. I really let the Lord down. Uh, he's probably really disappointed in me. I don't know that he ever really thought that. I don't think he even gave it at the time of day. I just think he had a goal. He had a journey. He was on it. He was going to do it. And, hey, if he didn't make it, he didn't make it. Hey, I'm with the Lord now. Uh, and, uh, and that's what's important. 
There's just so much that we can learn here from this great uh, inspirational <coughs> figure. Verse 29, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He had no idea what was awaiting him in Jerusalem, although he had been warned on many occasions that bondage awaits you. It's not good, Paul. He says, well, it's God's will. Going anyway. Trust in the Lord. And uh, whenever I get to these guys, man, I think it's just going to be awesome. It's going to be full of the measure of the blessing of Christ. Well, certainly with a life like this and a life like ours, we need prayer. That's his, uh, the last three verses. Paul's prayer was uh, a request for deliverance. In verse 30, he says, I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be rescued from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints there so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and together with you be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. The word... Uh, uh, strive together is uh, a term used of uh, an athlete giving his best uh, in the heat of a race or competition. It's translated sometimes wrestling together of uh, Epaphras in, uh, in Colossians. So he's really asking them to do some pretty intense praying for him. He knew what had awaited him, and what he was asking was three things. Personal deliverance, verse 31, that I may be delivered from those of Judea who do not believe, records a similar prayer in 2 Thessalonians, and that's what happened. I mean, as I read, uh, they were about ready to kill him, and he was literally delivered in answer to this prayer. Emotional acceptance, uh, Acts 21, verses 17 and 20, records uh, the joyous reception uh, and the solidarity that came into the churches as a result of this offering from the Gentile churches to the believers there in Jerusalem. And then thirdly, spiritual refreshment. He's praying that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be fresh together with you. Uh, and of course, he was when he finally arrived because he's in, he's in a, uh, Acts tells us, a, a prison, but it's like a rented room for him. Uh, he had a lot of freedom in terms of visitors, being able to teach and, uh, and minister uh, to unbelievers as well as to, uh, uh, to the church there and these men and women that he's uh, writing to. Uh, but notice the line may be refreshed together with you. He never met them, but this was Paul's experience. Anytime he could get together with believers, man, it was just a refreshing time. It was an, uh, an encouraging time. And uh, I find that to be true. Uh, no matter uh, where, where I go or who I'm with or with uh, other believers, of course, there's always something special about uh, uh, being here with, with you guys. But it should be the case. Uh, that we're able to know and be known uh, by each other enough so that when we're together, it's a, it's a refreshing time. Uh, you can watch over, over the Internet, and, uh, and God bless those that are doing that. That's not the same, that's not the same as being with, uh, with other believers, uh, and uh, it certainly was important to the Apostle Paul. It should be important to us. Again, Paul saw his life as fulfilling a duty of that of a priest, and we should really be able to, uh, you know, be able to kind of refocus our own mind. These are things I think we know uh, that you know when we're doing uh, the simplest things or just going through life. Life can, can be can be pretty mundane at times, just trying to earn a living and so forth. And we've talked about it before. Uh, we can kind of get into this cyclic deal where it's the weekend and we're just we're just kind of spinning, you know, like uh, time time goes uh, so quickly. Uh, but uh, we need to make sure we remember that we're not really living a cyclic life, just week in a week in or season to season. We're on a journey. We're going from point A to point B. Uh, we were born, and then we were born again, and we're on a journey. Uh, it's linear, and one day we're going to be with the Lord for all eternity. And what we do in between, even the mundane things, can all be done in such a way is that God can receive glory, and we can see it as, a, uh, as an opportunity to uh, serve Him. Uh, his desire was to glorify God. He never took credit for anything he did. All the home runs were God's home runs, uh, not, not, not his own. And I think that's one of the reasons God can uh, use his life and ours if we'll uh, see the same thing. And then he had a God-given dream for his life. And uh, yours may not be a Spain, but it might be something else. Uh, and if you're not sure what it is, pray and ask the Lord. You know, one of the, we were meeting with the kids, the high school kids on Friday night in our little <clears throat> apologetic study was on meaning and purpose uh, in the idea. And we talked about uh, that, uh, uh, you know, in this life, uh, there's a lot of people that uh, are searching for meaning, and they, uh, they go through a lot of 
gyrations uh, and different things. And we can watch the, uh, the Bill Gates of the world get at the end of their career and amass all the wealth in the world and all the breakthroughs in technology and decide, I think we better go feed some poor kids in Africa or do something here, you know, so they, God bless them, you know, they got their foundation, they're doing some good things. Why are they doing that? They're looking for some kind of meaning uh, in, in life. It's hard to find apart from a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But once we have that, we understand there, there is a purpose for me. In very simple terms, know God and make him known to others. And God wants to use our lives, and that purpose gives us meaning. It gives us meaning no matter what stage of life we're at. We don't accomplish it, and then it's over, and now what do I do? One of the other illustrations that was brought up in our little video presentation was that of uh, er Eric Little. Of course, I had to ask the kids, okay, how many saw chariots fire? Like, okay, we're doing this, we're watching chariots of fire. <laughs> Have to complete your education here. I mean, somebody's, dropped, somebody's dropping the ball on his parents, but uh, classic Christian movie. But uh, uh, anyway, he was one of the examples. You know, that, that's a great movie. You know, yeah, you know, Eric Little is this guy who's really uh, planning on being a missionary, an evangelist, and so forth. And uh, you know, he loved to run. And he said, you know, since it's God's present, you know, when he's running, he can run for the glory of God. But what, what his life was about, and then his life is contrasted with. Uh, uh, Abrams, uh, uh, the other uh, sprinter, you know, from Great Britain at that time. Oh, the big duel. Who will win? Eric Little, Abrams, and so forth. And of course, you know, Eric Little doesn't run because it's on it's on Sunday, and he, in his own uh, personal convictions, didn't believe he could do that. So he uh, disqualifies himself. And they come up with a 400 for a sprinter. That's a stretch, but he runs and he wins the whole thing. Uh, but you know, he goes on. He's a missionary in China. He still had a greater a greater purpose in his life that gave his life meaning. And the contrast is with Abrams, who his whole life was about winning the gold medal. And once it was over, he felt like his life was over. He had no idea what to do with himself. Uh, that should never be said uh, about a Christian because we have a purpose for our life. It gives us great meaning. It's not the only, it's not the only aspect of the gospel. We're saved from our sins, but certainly it's intrinsic to the gospel. It's something other people don't have. And when we recognize it in their lives, certainly we have something to share with them. God's got a, a dream for each of our lives, and we all need prayer. Prayer for deliverance. Uh, we need to pray. We need to pray earnestly for, for one another as well. These things might be set of our lives as also. Amen? Amen? You love the Apostle Paul? Awesome. Awesome guy. And you can pray for me because I'm thinking we probably should study the book of Acts. I, uh, next, I get, I get excited just, you know, looking, looking at his life and uh, uh, all, all that was uh, done, you know, in and through his life. Amazing, amazing man. Out of the wreckage of the down in the deepest dark, a rising fire and light. You come rushing like the wind and burning like a Adorns us like a jewel. Our 
Shout to me, Lord, underneath your wings. You shout to me, Lord. 